Good morning, First Baptist. Good to see each and every one of you here this morning. It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Uh, I told my wife this morning, you know, she said, well, you seem like you're in a better mood. I said, well, you have two reasons. She said, why? I said, well, it's Sunday, number one. And number two, I don't, get, I don't have to wear slacks that cut me in half. <laughs> so that's a good thing. But it's good to be in the house of God this morning. Would you stand as we begin to worship this morning with I'll Fly Away. Let me hear you worship with this old favorite this morning. already said it once for the 9 o'clock. I'm going to say it again for the 11. This is your city boy pastor. I didn't wear his overalls this morning, so there's that. <laughs> I already said once this morning, and I'll say it again. Sometimes I have to remind myself that I'm a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, First Baptist Church. How are you all this morning? Good. I am so glad to be here with you hillbillies today. Um, I walked in the church this morning. I'm just going to tell you, I've been in churches where we have these theme Sundays before, um, but I've also been in churches that are full with a bunch of liars that like to make you look strange. <laughs> so, I never, when I'm new to a church, participate in the first theme Sunday, because I knew what was gonna happen this morning is when I walked in, I was gonna have a pair of overalls, a straw hat, and a, pair, a, a piece of wheat hanging out of my mouth, and nobody else here would be like that. <laughs> then I'd really look goofy. But what happened actually was I walked into the church this morning. Pastor Trey looked at me up and down. I could tell. I could see the disappointment <laughs> in his eyes. And he said, you know, for every member of First Baptist Church that doesn't dress in their old-timey clothes, an angel loses their wings in heaven. <laughs> That's a pretty serious charge. So you better believe next year I'm going to have my overalls on. Amen? And you all better too. Well, good. I'm so glad that we get to be here to worship the Lord together. Real quick, I just want to point your attention to something, then I'm going to get down and we're going to continue to worship together. In your bulletin, there is a little information card. If you are a guest with us here at First Baptist Church, we would love it if you would take that and just tear it off and fill it out for us. We're not going to bother you, hound you, anything like that. We just want to know that you were here and you were with us, and we might send you a little letter or give you a call, something like that, just to tell you how thankful we were that you chose uh, to be here with us on a Sunday morning. Also, if you're a member or a regular attender, there's a place on here when, where you can fill out your prayer request. And while we're in this COVID season, we're starting to come through it a little bit, I feel like. But while we're in this, this is a good way for us to share as a church. And if you do that, if you put your prayer request on these cards, Pastor Trey and I will pray over these each and every week. 
We want to do that for you as members of this church. We're here to serve you. So if you have your bulletins, if you don't have one, be sure and grab one, but fill those out for us so that we know how we can pray for you. And if you were a guest, you were here with us for the first time. Okay? Let's read a passage of scripture together as we continue to worship. Psalm 71, verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord says this. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, to which I may continually come. You have given the command to save me. You are my rock and my fortress. Isn't it a glorious thing this morning that we have a rock and a fortress in Jesus Christ? The only name by which way we may be saved. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are that rock. You are that salvation. And Lord, what a beautiful name you have. We are so thankful that it is by the name of Jesus that we are saved from our sins. Lord, none of us, none of us are worthy of redemption. We have all fallen short of your glory. But you are a gracious and a loving God that sent your son to die on a cross. And it is by his name that we are saved. And oh, we are oh so thankful for that. You are a strong fortress, a mighty tower. You are our defender and our refuge. And we plead the blood of your son upon this church that you may bless us and keep us, that your face would shine upon us and that we would glorify you as your people. We love you, dear Lord. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Let's rise and continue to worship together this morning.
How's everybody? Good. Have you heard about the flu? It's all over the country. It's in schools, but as you can tell, I'm ready. <laughs> so, what are some ways you can protect yourself from the flu? Wear a mask. What about you? Wash your hands. Yeah, <laughs> and a tizer. Good, good. So the flu virus is pretty sneaky. It can get us when we're not least expecting it. Sin is pretty sneaky too. It can get us when we're not expecting it either. Genesis 4-7, God said to Cain, um, you should do the right thing. Even <laughs> oh goodness, I forgot it. <laughs> That's a good. <laughs> okay, well, um, it's important to, oh my goodness, I'm blanking. Um, yeah, sin sneaks up on us, and um, yeah, we got to be ready. I have my script. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, Jesus. God, okay. Um, God gives us tools to. <laughs> God gives us tools to stay protected from sin even when it's hard, like staying in church, doing Bible study, and having other Christians to keep us accountable. That's why it's important to stay in church. <laughs> All right, so let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what you've given us. Please protect us from illnesses like the flu and other things, and also please keep us safe from sin. In your name we pray, amen. Did she do a good job, everybody? <laughs> Let's stand and continue to worship with each other this morning. We have a song that's called He Touched Me. And the words are, are so simple and true. And it starts out with shackled by a heavy burden. I have burdens to you. Need the load of guilt and shame. And then what happened, folks? The hand of Jesus did what? Touched you and touched me. And all of us recovered. So let's continue to worship with this wonderful song this morning. Good to be here this morning. Um, 
and to be able to worship together. Turn in your Bibles to Acts 4 while you're making your way there. Uh, you know, when you get up in front of folks, sometimes your mind just goes blank. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, Holly did a good job. I know she stepped out with the kids. It made me re think of just, I've had a lot of bloopers up here. Y'all have seen uh, some of them, you know it? But it made me think of one, and I'll just tell you real quick, my first wedding I ever did, first wedding by myself that I ever, I'd done one before with a co-officiant, uh, co but everybody stood for the bride as she walked in, and they all stood, and I was supposed to have them sit down, and I didn't. They stood through the whole wedding. But <laughs> nobody sat down. And they'll never let me forget it either. It was my brother's wedding. <laughs> so, anyway, that's just part of it when, you're, when you get up in front. But, uh, wow, Holly did a great job. Kudos to her for coming up here and, and doing that. I hope you're in Acts 4 now. We're going to continue uh, in, through, through the book of Acts. Last week we saw, um, remember, Peter and John were walking and they noticed a man, a beggar. He was by the temple gate, and he was begging, and they healed the man. He had been lame from birth. He was a 40-year-old man. People gathered around. It drew quite a crowd. And then Peter launched into a gospel presentation. He began preaching the good news of Jesus Christ and confronting their unbelief. Well, we're going to pick up with that in chapter 4 because um, from that event... Many of those who heard did believe. We read in, in verse 4, in chapter 4, that they about 2,000 more individuals believed. The number reached 5,000. But there were the leaders the, of the Sadducees, some of the, the priests and the commanders of the temple, and, and they confronted them and actually put them in jail. They stayed overnight and they began to question them, said, by what power and in whose name has this happened? How was this man healed? And of course, what we read is that Peter and John then continued to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ with great boldness. And we're going to follow this account uh, this morning, and I'd ask you to stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word. And though I'll reference verses throughout chapter 4, we will look at verses 8 through 13, or we will, we will read verses 8 through 13 this morning together. After they questioned them, it says in verse 8, Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man, by what means he was healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him. This man is standing here before you healthy. This Jesus is the stone rejected by you builders, which has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to people. We must be saved by it. And when they observe the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men. They were amazed and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, bless our time in your word, God. By your Holy Spirit, convict us where we need to be convicted. Reassure our hearts where we need that, Lord. Encourage us Lord, you know what each of us need. We ask you, God, to apply this word to our hearts as we look at it this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. A few years ago, we went on a trip to, uh, to Destin. 
me and my, my parents and brothers. And anyway, we had, had a great time, of course. One morning, we set out and decided to go on a bicycle ride because we like riding bicycle. We decided we'd ride from Destin over to Panama City Beach uh, and, and back. And so that's what we set out to do. Now, as we were going, we were reminded of the impact of the wind upon bicyclists. You know, as we were going to Panama City Beach, we had the wind to our back. And that helps in the pedaling. Do you know that? It really does. And I kid you not, we were listening to the radio that day uh, on our phones. It was streaming. And as we were riding with the wind to our backs just pushing us, Leonard Skinner came on. They call me the breeze. I keep blowing down the road. And then we got to Panama City Beach, and then we turned around, we started heading back, and, and we were pedaling in against the wind. And I kid you not, I'm not making it up, Bob Seger came on against the wind. Isn't everything better with classic rock? I mean, it just is. But I tell you, I remember that. And then when we come upon these passages of Scripture, I'm reminded that we as Christians, we often expect the Christian life to be, they call me the breeze, when in reality it is against the wind. The Bible makes no bones about it. It confronts opposition to God's purposes throughout. There is a, an evil one whose aim is to still kill and destroy and to oppose everything that God is doing. What God, if, if, if you've experienced Jesus Christ, you are called to walk a walk that will fly in opposition to the worldly values and the world system that's around us. It is a walk that is against the wind, we might say. In Acts 4, this is the first time in the book of Acts where we really see opposition arising. We're going to see it this week and we're going to see it next week as well. But what should stand out is that even when opposition arose with these early believers, they kept their bold, they, they were bold in the gospel. They didn't back up. Remember, these are the same disciples that when Jesus was led to the cross, they abandoned him. All but the Apostle John, who was there at the foot of the cross with Jesus' mother that day. But Peter, the one that we will look at his message, the message that he preached, he was one that denied Jesus how many times? Three times. But here we are in the book of Acts, and we see that when pressure was brought upon these disciples, they did not back up. They kept proclaiming the gospel, even against the wind. We got to be bold. We need to be a church with grit. We need to be a people a, a with grit that follows the Lord, even when there's opposition. Let's look at what made these apostles bold this morning. The title of the message is Be Bold. First, I want you to notice that the resurrection is one reality that they recognize and that helped them to be bold. You see, it might be hard to follow a crucified Savior. And if Jesus stayed on the cross, we might not want to follow him. He would be a dead man and he'd just be like everybody else. But the Bible teaches that it didn't end on the cross. He rose from the grave. They saw him. They saw the resurrected Jesus and they had confidence to follow. Wouldn't that make a difference? Verse 10, you see the message when they were asked and we read it just a moment ago. He said to the, the folks that gathered to question him, he said, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that, that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing here before you healthy. 
He said, you want to know why this amazing power, this healing power uh, came upon this man? It was an announcement, and really it's a continued divine announcement that Jesus has risen. He lives today. Amen. That gave him confidence. Jesus is risen. We need to note something about Christianity. It is not fundamentally a life philosophy. If you wanted just a way of life, a life philosophy, you could look with, to Buddhism. You could look to Islam. You could look at a myriad of religious choices that would give you simply a life philosophy, a way to live, a teaching that maybe you could live by that you might motivate you. You could try to find that in a lot of places, but Christianity is not fundamentally a philosophy of life. It is the truth that hinges upon a historical occurrence. Jesus died and he rose again. You see, many other religions offer a way of life. Christianity is bold enough to make the core and the, the core central part of its message hinge upon the claim that one man rose from the dead. That's a mighty claim. If you want to prove that Christianity is false, if you want to attack the claims of Christianity, let me tell you where to try to do that. Look at the resurrection. If you could prove the resurrection, that it did not happen, then you would completely eliminate any claim of truth that we might present in terms of Christian truth. But guess what? The evidence points to the reality of Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul would say that Jesus rose and over 500 people saw him and he would say, and many of those people are still alive. Why did he say that? You know why he said that? He's saying, go ask them. They saw him. Something changed between the disciples who denied Jesus and then we see Acts, the disciples that would continue to be bold for Jesus Christ. They had experienced the risen Savior. That's one reason, not the only one, and maybe not even, well, I'll say it is not the most important one, but it is one reason that they were bold. Jesus lives. People have tried to attack the resurrection and one of the most common theories that is often, I mean, it really holds no weight is the idea that Jesus um, didn't really completely die on the cross. He just fell into a state of unconsciousness. He was beaten, bruised, received the 40 lashes. I mean, he, he was beaten within a just a smidge of his life, right? But then he went unconscious and didn't die, and later he kind of came to, and people thought that he resurrected. But understand uh, Gary Habermas, who is an apologist and a theologian, uh, a theologian, he pointed out that if that were the case, when Jesus was walking around after the third day, his body, well, let's just say it, he wouldn't be able to walk around. He would have had nails and spikes through his hands and his feet. His body would be so marred and in such horrible shape that nobody would claim that he had been resurrected from the dead in a glorified body. But that's exactly what they did. And the only thing that could, that, the only thing necessary to hush that movement would have been for the Roman government simply to show the body of Jesus. If they could have shown a body, they could have said, hush, he didn't rise from the dead. Your proclamation is worthless. And we'd have to say, yeah, that's true, if they had been able to show a body, but they couldn't. He actually rose from the grave. Amen. Amen. Jesus lives. That should make us bold, and it made them bold 
in that day. Now look up at verse 2 real quick and we'll move on from this point. But notice that they were proclaiming, it says, the resurrection from the dead using Jesus as an example. Which means they weren't just proclaiming that Jesus had risen from the dead. They were proclaiming the resurrection from the dead. They were saying, Jesus is the example and we all will rise from the dead. They were proclaiming the resurrection from the dead. We too will rise. And that reality should make us bold because Jesus lives. Secondly, notice the Holy Spirit in this passage. This is, I believe, the key point when we look at what made the disciples bold, it was the Holy Spirit of God. Remember, they had received the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. He came down, and it says in tongues of fire in Acts 2 verse 3. It's strange sounding, but that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember, John the Baptist said that one would come who would baptize with fire. And the tongues of fire visibly rested upon the disciples in Acts chapter 2. They received at that moment, they received the Holy Spirit. This is not their initial reception of the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit at what point? When we're saved. When we are saved, we receive the Holy Spirit. He indwells us. We're baptized by the Holy Spirit, meaning God makes his home in us. We are the temples of the Holy Spirit. Amen? We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But what we see in this passage is something that even though we're baptized into the Holy Spirit once, we can be filled with the Holy Spirit multiple times. Look at verse 8. He says, Then Peter, remember, Peter already received the Holy Spirit in Acts 2. But it says, Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, and then he continues to proclaim the good news. He, but he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he boldly spoke. He boldly spoke. Six of the eight times that Luke uses this word being filled when talking about the Holy Spirit, six of the eight times it, it speaks of people, individuals being empowered in order to speak. And so in this passage, we see exactly that. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and then he spoke this message, and they observed his boldness. You know what that means? It means that God and his Holy Spirit, even though you've already got him, listen, you've got the whole, if you're a believer in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit now, okay? Are we clear there? Because there's a lot of false teaching about the Holy Spirit out there. You've got the Holy Spirit if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. But the Bible says that at moments when we need him and God will use us to witness, it remind, the Bible reminds us that we are not alone. Amen. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. I think the way this works out in practice is that the Holy Spirit reminds us of scriptures that we have learned and brings them to mind in the moment that we need them. Has that ever happened to you where you're in a situation and you need to share truth and the Holy Spirit reminds you of a verse or a scripture that you've heard at that moment when you need it and the Holy Spirit reminds us of truth and then encourages us to step out and share in faith. Have you ever been somewhere and you feel that tug that, that tug, that nudge that says you need to share the gospel. You need to speak truth into the life of that person. And you, listen, I know this is subjective, but understand, I believe that oftentimes that's the Holy Spirit of God nudging you. He's telling you, listen, I'm here. I'm with you. God is with you. you. We all have lost people in our lives. 
I know we live in the Bible Belt and we, we might tend to think that everybody around us is a Christian, but I want you to understand if somebody doesn't show the fruit of a Christian life, the reality is Jesus said you know them by their what? Their fruits. Which means even if so many claim that they are Christians around us, there are lost people around us every day. Indeed, I will say this, and I know it is true, there are lost people in this room this morning. But the Holy Spirit is the one. Church, we're surrounded by lostness. And we were once lost. But now that we know him, the Holy Spirit, he fills us and he nudges us and encourages us to share. And church, if you're a believer in Christ, think about your coworkers, your friends, your family members. Just ask yourself the simple question. Ask yourself, if I don't share with that person, who will? Don't you think God, in all likelihood, in his sovereign plan, has placed you in that person's path to be a light? And when the Holy Spirit encourages you, don't, don't push him down. Don't suppress the Spirit of God. Step out in obedience. Trust him that he is with you. When God told his people, when Jesus sent his disciples and he said, go into the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them all I've commanded. And then he said this, and lo, I am what? I am with you. I'm with you. I do not believe, church, that being filled with the Holy Spirit makes you some kind of robot. I do not believe, church, that being filled with the Holy Spirit makes you do things with your body that are just uncontrollable and running up and down aisles and acting act in ways that we know is not described in the Scripture at all in a positive light. That is not the Holy Spirit of God, whatever that may be. But you know what? We're not turned into robots. But the Holy Spirit of God, when he fills us, he does encourage us and help us to be bold. This is the key difference. It wasn't just that they saw a resurrected Lord. It's that they had received God who made his home within themselves. And they were bold. And we ought to be bold as well. Amen? Amen. We need to, before we move on, there's a fly up here. Seems like there was a fly that made the news earlier this week. Anyway, <laughs> but uh, before, <laughs> before, we, before we move on from this point, let me share this. The Holy Spirit is not in the business of giving any words that contradict this word. In fact, if you read through the portions of Scripture and Acts where the Holy Spirit filled people, you see that they spoke and most, in every case that I know of, every case you find that those being filled with the Holy Spirit were not speaking new words as much as quoting the Scriptures. Which means if you want to be ready to share your faith, yes, the Holy Spirit can prompt you and remind you and help you to be bold. But listen, we've got to know the Word. Generally speaking, it means don't expect the Holy Spirit to give you a word in the moment if you've neglected His Word morning by morning. We've got to be in the Word. This is the sword, right? The sword of the Spirit. That's what it's called. Some of us are walking around with dull swords. They need sharpened. You know how we sharpen them? We, we get in the Word. 
That way we're ready in that moment when the Holy Spirit comes and, and encourages us and enables us to share our faith. We're ready. We have sharp swords. We know the Word of God. It's planted in our heart. So they were bold. They were bold because of the resurrection. They were bold because of the Holy Spirit. They were bold, thirdly, because of the saving name of Jesus. The saving name. You know, I was looking this up this week. People often change their names to another, they change their name to a greater name right? I just saw a few examples. Um, uh, Molly Cyrus's real name is Destiny Hope Cyrus. Did you know that? You don't care. I don't blame you. <laughs> uh, so anyway, Br <laughs> Bruno Mars. Bruno Mars, his, his real name is Peter Jean Hernandez. Elton John's name is uh, uh, Reginald Kenneth Dwight. Did you know Michael Keaton's real name is Michael Douglas? I guess he changed his name to differentiate himself from another actor. What about the name Marion Robert Morrison? That's the real name of John Wayne. People change their names to make themselves more marketable, to give themselves a, a greater name, but understand... There is one name who is the greatest of all names. And the name is what? Who? His name is Jesus. And it says in Philippians 2, it'll be at that name that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is what? He is Lord. He is the great name. Interestingly, earlier in Acts chapter 2, when Peter preached that first Pentecost sermon, he quoted Joel 2. And in his quote, in Acts 2, I believe it's verse 23, you can look it up, he ends the quote by saying this, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. When he quoted that, and there's no question in Joel 2, he was speaking of the Lord God Almighty. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And here in Acts 4, he speaks of that name. And he equates that saving name of the Lord God Almighty with Jesus Christ. Which, by the way, is a clear evidence for the deity of Jesus Christ. If Jesus isn't God, it would have been blasphemous for Peter to claim that it is his name, which is salvation, when he had just said that it is the name of the Lord God Almighty through which people can be saved. He is God. But look at Acts 4.12 and notice what he says. He says, there is salvation in no one else. Amen. For there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved or as the Holman says and we must be saved by it there's no other name maybe you're here this morning and you you haven't made that decision and trusted in Jesus can I tell you something I'm so glad that you were here this morning I am so glad, or maybe you're listening on, on TV or online, I'm so glad, but I, I want to tell you, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is a message not that there are many ways, but there's one, only one, and the reason is, is because no other way can deal with your sin problem. It took a sacrifice. It took one to die in your place for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ because guess what? He's the only one that died for me. And he's the only one that rose from the grave. Does it make any sense? Church, listen to this. There are many people that claim to be Christians and yet also at the same time tend to speak as though there are many ways to God. And those two do not go together. Ask yourself this question. Does it make any sense at all to believe that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son 
that whosoever believes in him or any of these other options can have eternal life. Listen, if there were multiple ways to God, why would God send his one and only son? Church, we need to hear this. We need to make sure that doctrinally we have trusted in the one who can save him, and that doctrinally we hold to that truth. Because in our diverse culture, and by the way, diversity is actually can be a great thing. Do you realize that people have come from all over the world to study in our colleges here in America? And do you realize that that's a wonderful opportunity for the church? We can do international missions in our backyard. Do you realize that's an incredible thing? Diversity is a wonderful thing. But here's the problem. It has sung us to sleep like a lullaby. Because with all the diversity, we've bought this lie that says, oh, that's what they believe. That's their truth. This is my truth. And as long as they don't mess with me, I won't mess with them. We tracking? I don't want I don't want people to go to hell. There is a part of me in my flesh that would love for there to be multiple ways to God. But you know what? It ought to embolden us when we look into God's word and we see that it says very clearly that there is no other name by which we can be saved. He's the one and only way. And he has shown, God has shown such an incredible love for you and for everyone who would believe by sending his son, Jesus Christ, who died in your place and rose again. What an incredible love he has shown and what a smack in the face if we turn around and reject it. We've got to trust in that one name. In Matthew 1, 21, the angel spoke to Joseph and he said, Mary will give birth to a son and you will name him what? Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus means Yahweh saves. His is the name that saves. If you want straight talk, you might think of the name of Dr. Phil. If you want financial advice, you might think of the name of Dave Ramsey or Edward Jones. If you want medical advice, you might think of the name Dr. Oz. Not endorsing any of these people, I'm just saying. Listen, if you want to find forgiveness, there is one name that ought to come to mind. And it's that sweet name of Jesus Christ. He died for you. Lastly, that, that made them bold, by the way, when they knew he was the only way they had to speak. But the authority of God made them bold because they recognized that God had more authority over them in their lives than any other individual on the planet, that no man could tell them to be quiet, to shut up. No government, no council had the power to contain the gospel of Christ. They said in verse 19 and 20, it'll be on the screen, look in your Bibles, uh, Peter and John answered them after they told them to shut up and be quiet and keep that name to themselves. They said, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Church, there might be times where because of pressure in our society, we are tempted to be quiet Listen, this is Old Tommy Sunday. And that's all well and good. And we can remember times in our culture that were friendlier to the gospel of Jesus Christ than now. 
Guess what? It's all well and good to celebrate old timey Sunday, but we don't live there. We live here right now in the present. The gospel must go forward. And there's going to be a day. There'll be a day when we look back on this day and think, man, it was easier then. Do you know that? And the Bible says that because things will get harder, it will weed out who's a true believer and who's not. Paul said in Timothy, he, he said, in the latter days, many will depart from the faith. Even as we find ourselves running against the wind, let us remember that our authority and the one whom we aim to please is God. Amen. And I pray for the grace to be, not, I'm not talking about being a pastor here, I pray the, for the grace to be the type of Christian, just like all of us who have trusted in Christ, I pray for the grace to be the type of Christian that even when there's pressure, I would love other people enough to share with them about the Jesus that changed me. we got to be bold. We're going to see next week how they prayed and how they were filled with boldness. I'll give you a sneak peek. Look down at verse 31 in your Bibles. They prayed. And all the Christians, not just the apostles, the whole church, when they had prayed, it says the place where they were assembled was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And look, they began to speak God's message with boldness. We have a lot of reasons for not being bold. We think I don't know enough. I've not been trained. I've not been to seminary. Did you notice that they were amazed at their boldness because they recognized that they were uneducated and untrained men. Meaning they hadn't had any formal education. They were educated. They walked with Jesus for three years, right? But they weren't formally educated. And I want you to know that you don't have to have a seminary degree to share the gospel with somebody. You don't have to have all the knowledge in the world to be able to tell somebody else about how they can know the God who loves them. Just look into your Bible and the Holy Spirit will remind you of the truths in that moment of need. And that will be pleasing to God even if man disapproves. Amen. Amen. Last week, I got to spend a few minutes with our four and five-year-olds. Uh, I enjoyed that time. And I led them in a song. I'm not going to sing for y'all. I sang for them. You can ask them how it went, okay? But we all need to hear the content of this song. And maybe you have. It's a children's song. It says, If I tell two people, and you tell two people, then four more people will know. Amen? Amen? If they tell two people and we tell two people, then more and more people will know. God gave us his son. He died for each one, but not all have heard the good news. So you tell two people, and I'll tell two people. And God's kingdom will grow. Amen. 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 The gospel of Jesus Christ is for anyone who would believe. Simply reach out. God did give his son. And he died for each one. If you just trust in Christ. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted in Him. You don't know where your salvation, where you stand with God, whether you are saved. Listen, 
You can trust in him today. Turn from your sin and trust in Jesus, the one who died for you and was raised. I'd love to talk to you about that decision. Maybe you're here and you want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. However God's leading, we're going to have a time of invitation. If you'll stand, I'm going to pray with you. If you'll stand, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. God, I thank you for the boldness in the early church. God, they, they believed and knew that, that your son, Jesus Christ, had risen and that he lives. They were filled by your Holy Spirit. God, they hung, they they clung tightly to that saving name of Jesus Christ. And they aimed to please you, even when man disapproved of that precious message. Father, I pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. Make us bold. There are those here this morning that you have placed a lost individual in their heart, a family member, a friend, or a coworker. Father, would we surrender to you today? God, would you help us to be obedient? share the gospel in a loving way that others might hear. I pray for anybody here, God, that does not know you. Help them to trust in your son today and be saved. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we're led, if you have a decision to make, I'll be here. Pastor Blaine's around. We'd love to talk to you. Maybe you just want to pray for that person God laid on your heart. You can do that where you are. You can come here to the altar. However God's leading, you respond this morning.
Sunday thing. It's good that y'all, y'all look better this Sunday than ever before. Y'all have a seat for just a minute. Let me give you just a couple reminders before we're dismissed. And then uh, I, we've got two deacons of the week, Jimmy Bible and David Carpenter. I don't see David. Uh, Jimmy's going to offer a word of prayer in just a moment over our offering before we're dismissed. But church, it is Heritage Days weekend, as is usual. We won't have a Sunday evening service tonight um, due to Heritage Days, but I had a chance to go through Friday night, and I walked through yesterday with my family. It was, it was a lot of fun, even, even in the rain. But uh, anyway, but keep that in mind. So no service this evening. Uh, this week's fall break. And so a lot of folks are traveling with that. With that in mind, uh, there'll be no children's activities and no meal on Wednesday night. So just note that, no meal, no children's activities this Wednesday night. We will have student activities, and there will be a prayer meeting in, the, in here on Wednesday night. But, uh, but no, no children and no meal uh, this week. God is so good, isn't he? Amen. Church, let's be bold. Let's, uh, let's not back up an inch, all right? Let's go against the wind. I'm going to let Brother Jimmy, he's going to offer a word of prayer. I appreciate him. Jimmy is our chair of deacons now, and he's our uh, deacon of the week this week. So thank you, Jim. Thank you.